you know, we, we often use, um, you know, whether it be in apologetics or in Bible studies, we, we refer to interpreting scripture according to the context of the day. We, we talk about the customs and the cultures of the time, the sorts of behaviors or the customs of the day when we interpret scripture. And, and I do the same, you know, when people speak to me about that and say, well, the Bible says it only profits a little, so what's the point? I'll tell you what the point is. There weren't many um, Zoom accounts floating around <laughs> uh, at the time that that scripture was written. And so you've got to factor in at the time of that writing, people actually lived a very different existence. We've got to create movement in our schedule. And that's why I believe that in this day and age, there is a space for organized exercise because uh, it just doesn't exist in many of our vocations and jobs. And so if nothing, if nothing more, the concept of exercise and movement in this day and age is there to basically replace uh, what you and I would have done as providers in any other era or generation. Welcome to the Hacker Podcast. My name is Greg Hackathorn. I hope you all are doing well. Today was a big day in the Hackathorn house. Our Ava May started kindergarten. She was very excited and nervous at the same time, all dressed up in her school uniform and a brand new black school shoes. I'm not sure who was more nervous, Ava or her mom and dad. It's hard to believe that our time of having her to ourselves is over, but such is life. We can't keep them at home forever. There may have been some tears shed under my sunglasses and maybe even mom's sunglasses this morning, but. We are excited for this next chapter of her life and all the adventures that it will bring. We are joined on the show today by Greg Wilmot. This is his second time on the podcast. We talked about his story in episode 15, so if you missed that one, I'd encourage you to go back and give it a listen. I invited him back on the podcast to talk about a subject that we are both passionate about, the importance of health and well-being, especially when it comes to ministry. But before we get to it, I want to encourage you to share this with a friend if it blesses you or on your social media and allow it to bless others and impact others. If you're a longtime listener to the show, can I ask you to please take a few minutes and leave it a rating or review? I would greatly appreciate that as it makes it easier for new listeners to discover the show in your country. This was a great review we received recently from Wiki on Apple Podcasts. He said, from the quality of the information provided to the professionalism in which the host leads every conversation and how guests answer questions and unpack biblical subjects and principles, I believe that the Hacker Podcast is one of those resources that will leave an indelible mark on both the casual and avid listeners of apostolic Pentecostal content. Thank you for that amazing review, Wiki. We will continue to strive to do the best that we can to provide you with apostolic content that will bless and challenge you. Now that that's taken care of, let's get to my conversation with Greg Wilmot. Well, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Awesome to be here with you, brother. Great to be back. We had a great conversation a couple months ago when when I started this thing, and we had this topic that we wanted to discuss in that conversation. I just felt like... Uh, this could be just a whole standalone episode of some of the things that we could talk about, some of the things that we could address about having a healthy lifestyle and, and making sure that we're exercising and looking after ourselves. And uh, I thought you would be a great person to come on to talk about this due to your background, what you studied, your experience as well with, with athletics, with sport, as well as how you continued on from that. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with us a little bit of your background, I know in our, our previous conversation you talked about how that you were a professional rugby player and that sort of thing, but more so about your studies and, and what you bring to the table in that regard. Yeah, no problems, brother. And as I said, it's wonderful to be here with you. So with regard to you know my studies, you may have mentioned in the last episode that um, throughout my school years, I wasn't really um, big on, on education, it wasn't something that I really prioritized. As a result of that, I, I didn't actually score too well in my final year and sort of didn't have too many options coming out of school. Uh, but what I did like was sport, as you mentioned in the intro there. And 
So I actually started off with a certificate three and a certificate four in fitness. Mm. I thought that's the most logical thing for me to do if I like, like sport. And so I did the certificate three and four and I ended up uh, getting a job at Fitness First. Uh, I think you might be familiar with Fitness First. Yeah, yeah. That was my um, first gym, I well, think, when I came to Australia. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of Pentecostals call them finance first because they pay tithes to, <laughs> exactly. and don't actually attend. Um, exactly. So, so, so I worked there for a year. And in that year, I actually came to God. I think I mentioned that to you in our last conversation. And I actually found um, just being a new Christian, working uh, at a gym, very different from actually just attending a gym, uh, you know, for an hour a day. And it wasn't actually an environment that I actually found very helpful as I was sort of changing almost every part of my life, really. Mm. And so I decided to leave that job and continue on in that journey. But in more of a a formal educational capacity. And so I enrolled at university. uh, And because I had scored so poorly at high school, all I could get into was a Bachelor of Arts. I couldn't get into anything around my interests. And so that being uh, what I was accepted into, I I studied a Bachelor of Arts for a year with the goal of doing as well as I could so that I could eventually transfer into a a course that was more more interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And so... After that first year, I actually studied really hard and I, and I scored reasonably well with my end of year results. And then I actually um, transferred into a Bachelor of Biomedical Science, majoring in cardiac investigation. So it was focusing on cardiovascular health and all things regarding understanding around heart health. And so that was the degree I undertook. Um, I did two years up here in, uh, up in Queensland, University of Queensland. Then when I met my wife, Uh, moved down to Sydney and and completed the degree down here. So that was kind of my journey from a high school dropout (laughs) to somehow um, working my way to studying with some incredibly bright people and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So that's your sort of a a bit of a medical background or your your studies. How did you get involved in health and fitness? So you talked a little bit about how you worked at a uh, at a gym. You also played rugby but Ultimately, you, you retired from that. So you had to continue on into staying fit and doing those sorts of things. So how did you find your way into that sort of pursuit? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, all through high school was you know, really involved in sport. And I actually played a lot of cricket and rugby all through school. And, and those two sports you know, place a lot of strain on your, on your spine. And uh, midway through grade 10, I, I started having... Uh, some really severe sciatic pains down my right leg and it got so bad that I went to get an MRI scan, went to a specialist and got an MRI scan and they identified that I had three cracked vertebrae in my lumbar spine. So L3, 4 and 5 had cracks in them and they weren't able to pinpoint whether it was from rugby or cricket but they said it was obviously stress fracture, sporting related. And so what they did was they actually gave me a, a back brace. <laughs> oh my god! Um, for yeah, for a full year I had a back brace, and it was this big plastic, um, tor- you know, like tourniquet type thing that went around my torso, and I had to had a Velcro strap, and I had to tighten it up, and it actually was quite useful. Uh, uh, there's a couple of um, uh, lunch lunchtime altercations where people <laughs> try to punch me in the stomach and end up breaking their knuckles, and I remember playing soccer at, in PE one day at school and someone kicked the ball into my stomach. The ball ricocheted around 60 metres off my stomach and I didn't, <laughs> even, I didn't even flinch, you know. <laughs> but um, so what happened, so I had that for, for a year and the idea was is that with that stabilising brace, at the end of that year, the bones would have healed. Unfortunately, at the end of that year, when I had my scans, they saw that the, the fractures were still there. There was no healing of that bone still to this day. I have the, the, the cracks in those vertebra. And so at the end of that, they referred me to an orthopedic surgeon who put me on to a specialized exercise rate uh, regimen that was designed to uh, strengthen those core stabilizing muscles. They call them the erector spinae group. There's three muscles that are really important for stabilizing the spine. And so I was put on a program and basically have been given a life sentence to exercise because 
because those vertebrae are still cracked and there's obviously the, the referring damage that radiates from those, uh, from those vertebrae, the orthopedic surgeon told me that if, if I lost integrity in those muscles, the pain that I had when I first discovered this injury would come back um, at any time in my life. So I've always had to ensure that you know, those stabilizing muscles remain strong. And from there, I had to obviously develop a rehabilitation program that focused mostly on core stabilizing muscles, but I was exposed to obviously a gym and build that program. And because I kind of knew I, I always had to maintain that exercise consistency in my life, I think pretty early on I accepted that this was going to be a part of my life and you know, I, I began to you know, embrace it and enjoy it. And um, this was obviously before I came to God. So, you know, I've, I suppose you know, before and after being saved, uh, exercise has really been a mainstay in my life. And as I mentioned earlier, that led me to getting the certificate three and four in fitness and then sort of really taking me down that path of medicine and, and exercise and health which I'm still involved in today. I had no idea that you had some fractures in your vertebrae. I've known you for how many years now? I had no, <laughs> I had no idea that was uh, a thing that, that happened to you. You're just full of surprises. <laughs> so you're talking a bit about how like you've continued to uh, maintain this and, and work at this uh, even when you came to God. And how did your attitude towards fitness, how did your attitude towards health how did that change once you came together? Because obviously there's, you know, you get the gym junkies out in the world, people who are just like love looking at themselves in the mirror and they're building muscle to look good and, and that sort of thing and to attract people. And then you come to God and, and there's this talk about humility and not being vain and those sorts of things. So how did your perspective have to shift when you came to the Lord? Yeah, really good question. And you know, as I was sort of thinking about you know what, what I was hoping to discuss. This is one of the, the real important topics, especially as you know, with you know, my involvement with young people and leading young people is obviously an area here where some young people can go down the wrong path. And uh, as you mentioned, this whole thing began out of you know protecting my spine. I wasn't living for God at that time, and I did get fully immersed in that gym environment. You know, I was all about the the tightest singlets you could find and all of that kind of pre-workouts and protein powders. And, you know, I got really immersed in that gym environment. And as I mentioned to you, that's really the, the main driver as to why I had to get out of that full-time gym exposure mm. when I came to, came to God because it was sort of antithetical to, you know, the, the principles of, of Scripture and, and living for God, being humble. And, and so I found I was wrestling with my vocation. You know, I... What began out of health morphed into you know, very eager, egotistical, prideful approach to exercise, where it was about your aesthetics and how you looked and, you know, appearing a certain way, having big arms and skipping leg day and all those sort of things. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, when I came to God, I recognized that that wasn't, wasn't very healthy. But I also knew that completely throwing it away was not the right answer as well. And this is that balance that I think is really important for believers to, to understand is that just because there is the potential for something to take hold of you and I suppose take you down a wrong path doesn't mean that there is a positive element to it as well. And when I think of this as a believer, as a minister, I think of money straight away, that money has corrupted many, many people. Mm -hmm. You know, money, the Bible says it's the root of all evil, and it is. And we've seen so many people, believers or not, be corrupted by money. But we also recognize money to be a, a critical element to the gospel. You know, we can put people in the mission fields with it, we can keep a church going. We don't run away from money because it has the ability to cause people to fall in certain areas. We understand how to use it wisely and in a godly way to benefit the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I see exercise in a very similar light. Yes, there are young people. There are people where exercise can take hold of them. It can uh, cause them to be prideful. But I also understand the absence of exercise can have a negative impact as well. And I've got a particular burden for, um, you know, I've had close friends of mine who, in other countries, where 
they've lost personal friends in their 40s and 50s, right in the, you know, in the, the peak of their ministry, ministry years. Mm. A cardiac failure out of nowhere, undiagnosed diabetes out of nowhere, and right at a time in their life where they were ministering to people and churches were growing and they were being used mightily, we lost them. And so I, I come at this from the perspective of not running away from exercise because it has caused a few people to go down the wrong tangent, but to understand that God created us to move mm-hmm. and we can actually harness those, those basic pillars of movement and exercise and health in a positive way to prolong our life and ministry. Look, I honestly believe one of the most spiritual things you can do is have good health that enables you to minister. Mm-hmm. You know, you we obviously have got our own genetic factors. I have genetics in me from my parents, as do you. But there are a large range of modifiable risk factors that we can actually control that will give us additional years active in ministry. And when, I, when, I, when we see people who are gifted and anointed cut short because of lifestyle decisions they've made, I think that's a tragedy. Yeah. And so... I think that's such a good point, especially when you're mentioning, you know, people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, they've built up these decades of uh, wisdom, these decades of knowledge and understanding in ministry, and then to lose it so quickly or to see them deteriorate so fast due to poor health choices or just maybe a lack of awareness, it's, it's sad to see because those voices are so important. They have the those decades of wisdom that they can pass along to the next generation. Or when you're for, in your 40s and your 50s as a minister, you're really like moving into that time where you can really make a significant impact. Not not that you can't when you're younger, but those tend to be when you start pastoring or leading a church for 10, 15 or so years, and you're making yeah. those generational impacts. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, it's also... The, the fact that for some of these people, it wasn't that they lived a, a really unhealthy life. For some of them, it was just, it was, it was a genetic factor, but it was a lack of awareness of their health that allowed them to be living, not knowing that they were a ticking time bomb. Mm. And I think a large part of this is not to uh, ask everybody to go and get a gym membership and exercise six days a week. It's for them to actually take time to think about their health I've got dear friends of mine, you know, who can be in their third, fourth, fifth decade of life and have never had a blood test. You know, mm. and these things are important because you can only act on things that you know about. And at the end of the day, having an awareness of our health, being mindful of, you know, our genetic factors, what our parents passed down is important for us if we do want to extend our active years in ministry. And I'm really passionate about that awareness. I like that as well, that you... You're not saying, and we're not saying through this episode, we're not saying that you need to, like, I'm a long-distance runner, so I'm not saying you need to sign up and run a marathon tomorrow and start training towards that. You're not saying that you do, well, you used to do a lot more powerlifting. I think you still do a good amount of heavy lifting and that sort of stuff. You're not saying that you need to go into the gym and and squat 100 kilos tomorrow and, and build your way up and just hit leg day every second day. You know, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about just monitoring your health and and. And what you're saying about having a, a, a simple blood work done, seeing you may look extremely healthy, or not extremely, but you could, you could look very healthy and have issues that are going on, underlying issues that, that you're not aware of, uh, simply because you never actually looked into it. And that's especially true for us men. Not many of us like to go to a doctor unless we absolutely have to. And even then, we tend to wait a few weeks before <laughs> we actually go to the doctor or to, to get any sort of testing or, or blood work done. But can you speak further to that? You, t- you touched on a little bit about the importance of making sure that you stay on top of your health, not just from a fitness perspective. Yes, that's very important, but also from this, this other area that you were talking about. Yeah, for sure. I suppose there's two parts of this, you know, when we talk about uh, general awareness of our health, which is the, the genetic factors passed down by us. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. So my grandmother... My father, both at the age of 30, were diagnosed with hypertension, high blood pressure. They were 
their body mass index was healthy, they were active, they ate well, but they had that early diagnosis. And so for me, with that information, I was paying very close attention to that cardiovascular marker. And so I started getting you know, regular checkups and blood work done at that age. And I found that I had it's called pre-hypertension. So not quite high blood pressure, but, but above where it should have been for my age. And that was a, a factor of my genetics and, and an awareness of that. And so, you know, when we talk about health, we talk about the genetic or non-modifiable factors and our modifiable factors, which are more around your modifiable factors are around what you eat, exercising and, and those sorts of things. And so, yes, it's a balance to have an awareness of uh, your family history, but also making good decisions for the, the foods that we eat and the movement that we perform each and every day. So I suppose that would be what's most important. And look, it's it's very confronting. And you mentioned before that as men, sometimes we shy away from this. And I think that sometimes that's largely, you know, self-preservation. Ignorance is bliss. What I don't know doesn't cause me stress. Exactly. Um, but so true. I, I, <laughs> I come from the school of thought, which is I'd rather know and get ahead of it than look back and realize that I've lived with diabetes for 20 years and didn't know it. And now I've got microvascular damage and I can't see properly. And, you know, we've heard of many sad stories along those lines where people have lived unknowingly with conditions that will limit their ability to minister and live a long life. Yeah. And that's horrible. Knowing that there was something that you could prevent just, but because you, you didn't get that additional information or you, or you didn't, take that uh, step of humility to go to the doctor and to talk to someone who can actually help you. And, and, and again, we're, we're even mentioning, we're even talking about like, if you you don't think anything's going lo- wrong, we still have an obligation to our family. We still have an obligation to our ministry, to what God has called us to do, to do regular checkups, to see how we're doing, to see what our health is like. We've said all of this, but uh, one of the good arguments that, that people love to use when they're talking about this and they pull out the Bible, we're going to get to the, the good book. First uh, Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, For bodily exercise profits a little, but goodness is profitable for all things. What do you say to that, Brother Greg? There's not much profit to bodily exercise. The Apostle Paul told Timothy that. Are you saying that you know yeah. more than the Apostle Paul? <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that. Although I, would say, I would say I'm living in a very, very different era to Apostle Paul. And, and that's what I do say when people use that scripture, which obviously it's been mentioned many, many times. You know, we, we often use, um, you know, whether it be in apologetics or in Bible studies, we, we refer to interpreting scripture according to the context of the day. We, we talk about the customs and the cultures of the time, the sorts of behaviors or the customs of the day when we interpret scripture. And I do the same, you know, when people speak to me about that and say, well, the Bible says it only profits a little, so what's the point? I'll tell you what the point is. There weren't many um, Zoom accounts floating around (laughs) uh, at the time that that scripture was written. Uh, We weren't using Microsoft Teams. Uh, We weren't owning MacBook Airs and having all of this technology at that time. And so you've got to factor in, at the time of that writing, people actually lived a very different existence. Yesterday, you and I were at an Australia Day picnic for, for our church, and we had a wonderful time. And there was a gentleman there uh, that we all love dearly by the name of Brother Bully. And here is a man, a great man, who doesn't actually have a gym membership, to my knowledge, but is extremely healthy and extremely fit. Just look at the guy. I mean, he's in great shape. <laughs> and he's in great shape. He's in great shape because he's a landscaper. He's mm-hmm. out and about, and he's exercising, you know. He, He's not lifting weights every day, but he's active as part of his lifestyle, his vocation. And so he's exercising, he's moving. And, uh, but you contrast that with the majority of us, like you and I, you know, Mm -hmm. we spend our time sitting down that the most movement that we'll typically do is go and walk to make a coffee or, um, (laughs) walk the bathroom or that and and back. Uh, and so for us, if we're going to match the amount of movement that someone like for the bully, uh, has, we've got to create movement in our schedule. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe that in this day and age, there is a space for organized exercise because uh, it just doesn't exist in many of our vocations and jobs. And so if nothing, if nothing more 
the concept of exercise and movement in this day and age is there to basically replace uh, what you and I would have done as providers in any other era or generation before us. The Apostle Paul was doing a lot of walking, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't just hopping in the car and, and going from city to city, but uh, I would imagine he was doing uh, quite a bit of walking when, when he's writing that scripture. They, what, what's the total that you're supposed to do a day? I think they tell you to do 10,000 steps. I don't know if that's 10, actually steps. scientific or if... Uh, some company, some watch company made that up, Fitbit made it up so they could get more sales. I don't know, but if, if I don't actually run, if I don't have a, a run on the calendar that day, I mean, it it, it could be pretty scary how little it's movement a, I'm a doing. Low, yeah, it's a low count, isn't it? If we don't go for a <laughs> run or, or exercise, you know, I mean, if Apostle Paul had a watch, a Fitbit watch, he would have probably won those competitions, I imagine. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the point is that, we live in a very, very different existence, and this conversation is not about you know setting world records on the bench press. It's about us understanding the way that we were made, which was to move. And if we're living a life or have a job that does not involve movement, then we actually got to create it and, and manufacture that in our day. And that's really the point. Well, I appreciate you crushing my dream because I was planning to go for that world record bench press, starting from scratch. <laughs> you know, that was my goal and. In 2022, by the end of the year, I was going to hit that. I'm well on my way. I'm yet to do one bench press this year, so I'm about to. <laughs> That's it. You actually yeah. forgot to mention earlier um, uh, that I've, I've actually moved into the hybrid athlete. Oh, that's um, right. I forgot, forgot to mention, mention that. Earlier. Yeah. I'm not all about the weights anymore. I'm actually doing a bit of running and bike yeah. riding as well. So Yeah, lots of cardio. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, we're going to see how much that pays off in a couple of months at the Avid Runner. We're going to see uh, <laughs> how hybrid of an fun. athlete it's you are. Fun. Absolutely. Brother, I was, looking at, I was also going to mention, you touched on scripture. I think you mentioned Timothy 4, 8 there. And as a youth leader, there's actually another portion of text that uh, is often mentioned and, and used, I think, in good in, with good intention that I just want to touch on because I think there is an important uh, point of clarification. You know the scripture, first, first Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen, where the Bible says, "You know, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost," and it, and it refers to the way in which we are to treat ourselves. And and oftentimes, you know, this is a scripture that is rightly used uh, to young people or any person really, uh, as it relates to things like you know, inking our skin or smoking cigarettes or using drugs or whatever it may be that's detrimental. And it's often used um, in context in those sorts of conversations. And, I, and I'm not here to disagree with that. But the important point is, is that I think if we're going to be true to the scripture, and that's what it's about is being true to the scripture itself, that scripture actually applies to things that are, that are beyond smoking and drugs and all of that. And it applies to things like the sugar, sugar epidemic that we're living in and or you know, saturated fat epidemic that we're living in. And I, I believe that if we're going to be true to that scripture, we must also be honest about the fact that, for example, every country that actually uh, has statistics on mortality and death, right, every single country that has statistics on that will show you that there are more lives lost as a result of metabolic disorder, diabetes, mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease and heart disease, Mm -hmm. then there are lives lost to lung, lung cancer or drug overdoses, for example. And so if we truly are going to minister to our young people or minister to, to, to saints uh, with regard to how to treat their body as it relates to cigarette smoking, whatever it may be, we must continue that conversation uh, and apply it to what we're eating. And listen, I'll put my hand up, Brother Greg. I'll eat your sister Stephanie Hackathon snickers cookies uh <laughs> at, at, you know all day every day but but if i'm going to be if i'm going to be serious it really is about moderation and understanding that if we are going to eat whatever we want every single day every day of our life there'll be a price and a consequence to that and that's just the reality i know as apostolics we love going to mcdonald's after church and again i believe moderation is wonderful and we can do all of that but we must understand that uh, that's not something that we can do every single day without it catching up with us at some point. And I'm really passionate about that because 
I feel as though we don't go all the way uh, with regards to that scripture in terms of you know, the lifestyle of even Christian people. Yeah, it's an important passage, and we definitely use that in reference to drugs, in reference to smoking, you know, things that aren't mentioned in the Bible, but other things that we may struggle with, you're kind of like, oh, I don't know if that really applies, or, you know, I really do want, like, three pieces of chocolate cake, um, <laughs> and, and this isn't to uh, have a go at anyone or anything like that, you know, I'm, I've got a sweet tooth, I struggle with that, but, you know, we can do some things, if we are going to eat unhealthy, if we're not going to eat the right types of food, at least we can do a bit of exercise to try and counterbalance that, and I know as a as someone who knows a lot about these sorts of things, you can't outrun a bad diet. It doesn't matter how much you run. It can, it can have knock-on effects w- within, your, within your system. So you do need to make sure that you are having a, a, bit, of a, uh, a bit of balance to your diet and, and not just saying, oh, I'm just going to do 30,000 steps today to, so I can eat whatever I want. But. I, I, I vividly recall in second year when I was – I studied in my biomedical science degree. We had a cardiologist come uh, and he was presenting, actual surgeon. And, you know, at that time, like in person, you know, my favorite, I had I used to love giving the ultimate burger box meals with an extra Zinger burger. That was my staple. I had a sweet tooth as well. And listen, I still do. You know, I, I enjoy those foods from time to time. I'm certainly not against that. But I remember asking this cardiologist, I said, listen, I exercise six days a week. I'm very active play a lot of sport, is it okay if, like, I do that and eat whatever I want? Like, does that kind of cancel each other out? And and the cardiologist laughed at me and said exactly what you said, Brother Greg, which is, mate, you can never outrun a bad diet. Uh, so that crushed my dreams and broke my heart and reminded me that even though I love to exercise, that I've still got to eat in moderation and eat in a balanced way. And so I've tried my best to live that way, but not always successful. Let's just say I ran all the way through the Christmas break, didn't take any time <laughs> off, and still somehow put on some kilos. <laughs> you definitely exactly. can't outrun a bad diet. Well, we've, exactly. Talk, exactly. we've talked about the importance of it and highlighted why this is something we should talk about. You know, we just wanted to do this episode to start a conversation. It's not to uh, put anyone on the spot, make anyone feel bad or anything like that. That's not what this is about at all. We all have areas that we can fix but it was more so just to bring this conversation to the forefront because both of us are very passionate about this and, and we think that it's something that the body of Christ needs to be talking about a bit more. So beyond just talking about it, what are some uh, basic principles? How can someone start, like say they want to try and implement some changes in their life? What are some ways that they can get uh, started in, in making some of these changes? Great question, brother. And I think bringing it to a practical space is, is really good. Well, the, God made us in two two ways. The first way, he made us in a way that we will always adapt to what we do, which means if we're not doing much and we're eating a lot, then we're going to put on weight. Uh, if we change that lifestyle around, then obviously we can move things in the right direction. But the other important point is that it's actually never too late. And I've had this conversation with so many people that feel as though for 10, 20 or 30 years, uh, they had you know, what they would consider poor lifestyle, poor diet, never exercised. And they kind of felt like it was a waste of time to even start. And mm. the, the evidence bears out that that is not the case, that your body will always adapt to any change that you make, which means that if you say 50 years of age and you've got 45 years of not much exercise or poor diet, it's never too late to make small changes in the right direction because your body will always adapt. Will you be an Olympic athlete? Probably not, but your body will respond in a positive way as it relates to your blood work, you know, your cholesterol, your sugar levels. All of those things are modifiable even later in life. That's the first thing. The second thing, the second way God made us is regardless of your level of fitness or your level of health, there's a concept called progressive overload, which means if I go from a place of not even walking to just just going for a five-minute walk each day, that's going to have a positive impact on my heart, on the way that my body 
um, processes that, that stress level. If you're an Olympic athlete and you've gone from benching 200 kilograms and then you increase that to benching 210 kilograms, that is also progressive overload and your body will adapt. And so the point is this, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what level of fitness you currently have, it doesn't matter what your exercise history has been, you can always make a small step in the right direction which will make a meaningful and clear change to your health. And mm. that's, that should really encourage people because, you know, when I was working in the gym, Brother Greg, as a personal trainer, the amount of people that said to me, is this a waste of time? Uh, I'm not unfit. I've never been an exercise person. Like, am I wasting my time here? And I would say to them, you are not wasting your time. And I'll watch these people over one, three, six months, one year, five years, completely transform their life because they actually saw the, the fruits of their effort. And so I want to encourage the hearers here that it doesn't matter who you are, what you're doing, uh, you can certainly move in the right direction. And so you start with your current level, right? So if you're somebody that a, a five minute walk is tough for you, then that's great. Then you, you, you can start working towards doing a 10 minute walk each day. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when that becomes something your body can handle, you move to 15 minute walks and you can actually, it's like your prayer life. You know, when I first came mm -hmm. to God, a five, praying for five minutes felt like four hours, you know? <laughs> And, it, and if I'm going to be honest, sometimes uh, it can still feel that way, yeah. uh, if I'm going to be honest for a moment. But as you grow spiritually, you know, you recognize that um, you can actually carry out those spiritual disciplines with more maturity and a little bit more easily. And it's the same with your body. You know? yeah. With regard to what you're doing, you can always do more and, and take a small step in the right direction. So that's, that's a really important principle. And that qualifies everybody to be able to make small changes that'll make a meaningful difference to their health. Yeah, and and if we make enough small changes over time, as you said, you're going to be able to do more and more and more. Uh, like I always, it's funny that you mentioned prayer. I was going to mention that as well because I, I always link the two, uh, running, because I, I like to use that as an example, with prayer when I teach New Life Journey and I talk about, hey, if you want to run further, you got to start maybe one kilometer and then you can gradually build up but you don't go from like one kilometer to 20 kilometers you don't go from five minutes of prayer to an hour of prayer and you know do a good job you might make it an hour but uh you might be fulfilling scripture where jesus is saying you're using vain repetitions and, and that sort of stuff but yeah it, it's a gradual increase and as you said e even with prayer it's the same with exercise that myself as a runner there's times where i'll go out for a 5k run and it feels terrible. But even if I'm running a 5K and I feel terrible during the run, after the run, I always feel great. Unless I'm injured, I always feel great because I got out the door, I did something, I got the heart pumping, I got the blood moving uh, through the body and, and, and got that sweat. Was there any uh, final thoughts that Absolutely. you wanted to share before we, we wrap up here today? Yeah, absolutely. And great points. And, you know, I I would agree 100% that, you know, I think when when it becomes part of your lifestyle, it, it has a positive impact on your mental health and it declutters your mind. You know, I've actually found that some of my clearest thoughts will take place when I'm out going for a walk or going for a ride and that's been really beneficial. And, and also productivity. I find when I'm at home and I'm just being a bit of a sloth, I don't feel like doing things, you know, and sometimes it's as simple as getting out and about, going for a walk or a run, doing some exercise that I come back and I feel motivated to do some positive things like open my Bible or pray or do something that's that's beneficial. But my final, you know, I suppose my final words would be going back to connecting this with our ministries. I know a lot of people that listen to this podcast are in ministry and are interested in propagating the gospel. Uh, like I truly believe that one of the greatest things that you can do is to continue in your ministry. You know, there are a lot of people uh, later in life that are alive their heart's beating and they're breathing, but they're not functional. They're, they, they, they're unable to execute their ministry because, you know, they might be bed bound or at a hospital or whatever it may be. But by making some positive steps in the right direction with regard to having some sort of balanced diet and moving daily, you are adding years to your ministry. You're adding years to your ability to have an impact on this world to continue to see growth in your church, in your own walk with God. 
uh, to continue to mentor people, you know, the impacts on the kingdom of God simply by your ministry being active cannot be measured. And so my encouragement would be that there is a, a strong connection between these de decisions daily that we make regarding our health and our longevity in the kingdom of God. So I want to encourage you, regardless of your level of fitness or your awareness of your health right now, that you can actually make a change today that will keep you active in the ministry longer than you otherwise would.